Well, welcome to uh, people from throughout the world who are here to hear about one of the new exciting carbon capture and uh, sequestration projects which has uh, just started underway. This is Kevin O'Brien. I'm the principal manager for carbon capture here at the uh, uh, Global uh, CCS Institute and I'm uh, very excited to be able to share with you some of the latest news as to what's happening up in the province of Alberta, Canada and in particular with the North Northwest Red Water Partnership. So this will be a great opportunity to hear from a group of people who have reached the point where they have actually broken ground and started a project. And they're going to share with you today some of the challenges as well as some of the features that they've been able to overcome. So we're excited to be able to uh, produce this as part of the uh, GCS, GCCS Institute. Let me first begin, though, by going through a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, in terms of questions, uh, we're going to ask you to please uh, enter your questions on the screen, which we'll look as shown here. We will then collect uh, your questions, and then I will pose those questions after the presentation. And uh, I'll try to go through as many of those questions as possible, because I think it's very critical. And I know our speakers are very interested in having a lot of interactions with all of you. Uh, as I mentioned, this is going to be a discussion on the Northwest Sturgeon Refinery, which is part of the Northwest Redwater Partnership. And what's very exciting is we have two of the main folks who are involved in making this project happen here today. And let me give you their bios, put those up on the screen. The first is Terry Kemp. Terry is the Vice President of Marketing and Business Development for the NWR. He's a highly creative executive. He's been involved in quite a number of projects. And most importantly, a lot of experience in the oil and gas business, especially as you can see with Imperial Oil, which is the Canadian arm of ExxonMobil. So he's been involved in to talk about large projects. Also, we're very lucky to also have Kevin Heal. Kevin Heal, as you can see, is the advisor for these projects and is Vice President of Marketing and Business Development. He's had all, over 20 years experience in Calgary, which as you know is a major energy market, uh, not only within the province of Alberta, but also from a global perspective. And uh, one of the exciting things is Kevin has especially been focused uh, recently over the last eight years on carbon capture and storage, enhanced oil recovery, uh, bitumen upgrading, power generation. So uh, he comes with a lot of experience, not only in the area of CCS, but also the application, for example, uh, in this case, enhanced oil recovery. So uh, with that background and the, uh, two very strong speakers, uh, I'm going to turn it over to our group to talk a little bit about their project. Afternoon, wherever we may find you. Um, it's a, very, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about our project. Um, just a quick note, we're sitting in Calgary. It's just a little after 12 o'clock. Uh, it's a nice blue sky day out there, but it's actually uh, one of our first days of real winter. It was about minus 8 Celsius. We got a little bit of snow on the ground. And earlier when we were getting ready for the presentation, we were just starting about talking about the start of the ski season, which will be opening up uh, this week up in the mountains. So uh, I'm sure different than a lot of other environments, but uh, as we head into our winter, we, we do enjoy that part of our season. Anyway, what I'm going to be talking about today is the Northwest uh, Sturgeon Refinery Project. Um, what I'm going to be going through is really a business uh, discussion as opposed to a detailed technical discussion. Uh, I'll touch on what the, the business purposes and the structure of our organization, some of the issues and business drivers that uh, we've been dealing with, uh, where the project is at right now. Uh, we'll touch then on the design that uh, has led up to the CO2 recovery aspects of our project and then what the benefits of those uh, aspects of the project uh, have been overall. Uh, to begin with then, uh, what our project is about is taking uh, bitumen blends from the Canadian oil sands into a refinery that will convert those bitumen blends here in Alberta into uh, slate of finished products. Um, the 
project right now is in its execution phase, and it's an, I would say early stage execution. We're in the field now starting construction. Um, we're at the start of about a three-year process to finish that construction off, and we expect the project to be finished in the uh, mid to late 2016 time frame. Um, what the project will be doing, though, is taking uh, bitumen blending and turning it into high-quality uh, products. We won't be producing any STO or synthetic crude oil. Uh, and it's not just about considerations about uh, uh, greenhouse gases. It's also about a number of efficiencies that we've uh, built into our project that look at forward-looking environmental requirements, uh, fuel standards of the future. And we've built those features in looking at, uh, I think, where we need to be uh, going 20 years forward versus designs and refinery uh, constructions that have been built uh, in the past 20 years. Uh, the project has also been fully permitted. Uh, we've been permitted for three phases of development. We're actually building the first phase right now, which is approximately 80,000 barrels a day of feedstock. Uh, when all three phases are built out, it would be around 240,000 barrels a day which will be the largest refinery in Western Canada. Uh, one other feature before I go off the slide is we were talking about um, some of the clean products. The, the project is really focused on, on one product, which is making uh, what we call clean diesel. And again, looking forward at um, diesel specifications and demands, uh, CAPI standards in the US, we're seeing a number of, of uh, opportunities around uh, diesel marketing out of Western Canada. So that's been one of the big economic drivers for the project. So where the project is, um, we call this location and uh, a number of features with it. It's in the center of the, what we call the Alberta Industrial Heartland. And while the, our project is in a greenfield development as shown in the picture, uh, this is a slide looking north uh, and immediately adjacent to it is a large uh, fertilizer plant owned by Agrium. Uh, we have a pipeline terminals bringing bitumen blend to the corner of the property and a number of other infrastructures such as rail, power, uh, highways, um, water in the immediate vicinity. So this makes it an ideal location for building this type of a, a facility. Uh, just off the picture immediately to the south down here is where Shell has a very large complex uh, where they have a refinery uh, bitumen upgrader. So it's a it's existing site, very active, and we're sitting on the north side of the North Saskatchewan River um, adjacent to all that development. The other uh, benefit of this site is it's really the, the hub uh, of where a number of the uh, oil sands pipelines are bringing their production into Edmonton. So in this uh, little map on the left, there's different pockets of oil sands. They're all bringing their production down into the Edmonton area in different pipelines, and we're able to uh, tap into all of that production and bring it into our, our, our refinery. Um, in addition to that, we are the starting point of a CO2 pipeline, which will be able to take CO2 from our, our site down into central Alberta, where there's a number of of uh, old reservoirs which will act for enhanced oil recovery and eventual uh, sequestration of the CO2. Now a little bit about the business structure. Um, what, uh, what's needed to make a, this is a multi-billion dollar project. Um, we started out as what we call a merchant operator in which we would buy and sell the crude oil feedstock and the products coming out the other end. Um, that became far more difficult to advance a project as we went through the uh, downturn in 2008 and 2009. And what we did is converted it into far more of a tolling type of structure, very similar to how a pipeline uh, would be set up today. Um, so the key feature of that uh, tolling arrangement is we have the Alberta government, which is uh, through their royalty uh, um, take on the oil sands is one of the top five producers of the oil sands. Canadian Natural Resources, which is in the top five as well. Uh, both these uh, groups are supplying us uh, bitumen blend feedstock and paying a toll to go through the plant under a 30-year processing contract. 
Um, the Alberta government has 75% of the nameplate capacity. CNRL has 25%. Uh, what this does for you is by providing this guarantee for toll, it, it guarantees the payment of the, the debt, the equity, the operating cost, uh, and it becomes a very secure structure. Um, the um, financing world likes that because now we are able to move into what we call an investment grade type of financing structure which satisfies the banks and the other finance uh, parties to the project. Uh, the other feature of this is it's set up as a partnership uh, where Northwest Upgrading is the, uh, the original founder developer of the project and Canadian Natural Refining Limited CNUL has come in and they are now also at 50 percent. So this Canadian Natural is a subsidiary of Canadian Natural Resources which is the uh, providing part of the feedstock for the plant but they're also an owner of the plant now as well. Uh, by having a partner in the, in the structure also provides uh, again some uh, depth and security around the financing and the uh, knowledge that the plant uh, has a lot of backing to get it finished and built. So I'm going to step back a little bit and talk about some of the issues and dis discuss the project from the context of these type of, of elements. Um, first, Alberta is a very large producer of hydrocarbons, including bitumen, um, and the growth in that uh, development is uh, around bitumen. So for the, for the foreseeable future, um, oil sands growth will be part of the Alberta fabric. So the problem is, where does all that production go? Uh, we can currently fill the markets we have, we fill the pipelines that we have, but the incremental production coming on really has to have new markets to be developed. So that's one issue. The next issue is adding value at home. Well, we have this uh, incredible resource to produce. Uh, we would also like to be able to capture some of the value add or the benefits of taking that from a raw product into a finished product and those types of benefits. So that's been one of the themes of the Alberta government is how you can capture more of the value uplift from all of the resource uh, that's in place. The third issue is around the uh, greenhouse gas threat. And that's really getting ahead of this or being in front of this issue. Um, we will produce fuels that will be, meeting the, uh, be able to meet a low carbon fuel standard. And we see uh, those types of things coming forward into the future that will have to be looked at. And so we're not trying to catch up, we're not trying to retrofit plants to be able to meet what future requirements are. We've actually got ahead of the curve now and developed our facilities and our plan based on having carbon capture as a primary element and something we recognize uh, will be needed in the future. These are the, these are the components and that really set up some of the, the economic drivers and the basis for the plant. So what I'm going to go through now is I'll talk about a number of these issues uh, relative to um, the, uh, the economics of the plant. And then, as I said before, I'm going to step back through a number of um, what the plant looks like and everything else. But we'll, for now, just go through each of these elements. So from the production end, uh, the first chart shows the, what would be considered uh, raw bitumen production or the production that is not going, it's not integrated, it's not part of a mine, it's not part of any integrated synthetic crude oil that uh, most people would hear about. This is production that's coming largely from in situ where it's being produced either conventional means or steam assisted gravity drainage. Um, we've crossed over the million barrel mark uh, sometime last year. Certainly we're sitting around 1.1 million barrels. If you look at the chart on the bottom, this is really the forecast going forward. So uh, this is the range we are from gross production, and this includes light oils, heavy oils, conventional, uh, and upgraded uh, synthetic oils. You see the blue band in the, in the top is where all that growth is, as I mentioned before. The lower part is relatively flat. So again, all the growth in Alberta production is going to be coming out of oil sands. All that growth right now is forecast to be uh, raw bitumen that will then be blended with uh, lighter crude oils in order to make it uh, reduce viscosity so it can be put in pipelines and then shipped out to markets. Where does all that go oil go? 
uh, today it's largely going on a series of pipelines that move into uh, some refining in Western Canada, refining in the U.S. Midwest, Chicago area, and also access into the refinery, refineries on the Gulf Coast. Um, you've all heard about all the challenges there is with putting pipelines in today, and where, uh, where all that production will end up is still a bit of a question. Um, we've also seen the last little while where rail cars have been used to move around the, the, both the pipeline constraints, but also the, pipe, the pricing of the crude has been better by being able to jump around the uh, congestion of the pipeline world uh, to markets which are largely on the, on the coastlines. These are the markets that are receiving uh, world prices for their crudes. Uh, what this does is sets up some of the pricing issues and then sitting in Alberta we're able to take advantage of the feedstock price in terms of it's competing against all these various markets and it's also receiving a price that's reflective of all the transportation log logistics and discounting that goes on back to the market. So one of our economic drivers is we're in a much better pricing environment here in Alberta for taking in this feedstock than we would be by having to move it through uh, these networks. Uh, the next point is that even when you get it through the pipeline to get it to these markets, these markets aren't sitting empty today. Uh, the refineries in the Gulf Coast are all operating um, at capacities. So we're really competing in a, a marketplace that is already satisfied. And in order to do that, in order to be able to push your production into those markets, we uh, price is what will determine the difference. So we will become suppliers into well service markets right now and then we'll start to see more price impact back in Alberta. And again that's just setting up some of the some of the economic uh, benefits for our project being located in Alberta. A little bit on the environmental uh, side of it is if you look at the conventional way that uh, refineries have been able to process bitumen, it's generally through the use of delayed coking. And a number of coking projects have been built uh, in refineries in, in the U.S. recently, our expansions. Um, one of the challenges with coking is a number of the, the greenhouse gases that are produced uh, venting when you're actually going through the refining process. But secondly is you produce a lot of coke. Uh, petroleum coke is generally high sulfur, contains a number of uh, metals and other impurities. And the primary market for that coke, since it really can't be stored long term in, at any of the refinery sites, is to ship it off for combustion in coal-fired power plants. Uh, so then we're actually adding additional uh, level of CO2 uh, when it's going through that combustion phase. Um, it's really just displacing coal in coal plants. Um, well, this isn't really relative to our uh, project, it just shows that in uh, the impact of burning um, uh, coal and coal-fired plants in China and the U.S. is a very significant uh, CO2 contributor and as compared to the oil sands, oil sands is a very small uh, little wedge. Uh, so, but the one point that we look at is eventually uh, being able to handle coke and ship it off these power plants will become more and more problematic and more and more costly for the refinery. So by getting ahead of that and dealing with a process that doesn't have to ship coke away, because we don't use a coking process, and I'll describe that uh, in a few moments, uh, we're able to eliminate this risk and this future uh, cost exposure. A little bit of on, on the CO2 handling, um, really it's, it's why in Alberta, and we feel that Alberta is a much better place to, to manage our, our CO2. Um, we're able to, uh, instead of shifting the problem down to uh, a market in the U.S. that will produce coal and ship it away, have emissions, we're able to handle the CO2 here where we can capture it uh, through a facility, uh, put it into a pipeline, and that pipeline will be connected up to a number of existing oil reservoirs that will use it for enhanced oil recovery, so they'll produce ad additional light oil from that reservoir for a period of time, and then these reservoirs will be sealed and used for long-term sequestration of that CO2, so it will be locked in there. So a few years of producing oil, and then they will be locked in. Uh, we have 
many, many, many of these reservoirs. And uh, one of the stats I've heard before is there's um, over 100 years of storage capacity that we could be utilizing. This pipeline, it's called the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line, and uh, it's being built as a parallel project to ours. So we'll, we're sitting at the top end of the line up here, and again, it will be taking production down to central Alberta, and there's a number of spurs that will come off this that will uh, move over to other reservoirs. Uh, one of the other benefits of being Alberta in that we have a, a large emitter tax regime where there basically any any plant is is being charged a CO2 cost if it's not mitigated, and so we're able to uh, use that as an incentive for uh, taking that charge from large emitters and capturing the CO2, and then so there's an avoidance. So there's a number of plants and facilities in the Edmonton, Fort Saskatchewan area that once this infrastructure is in place should be able to take advantage of that. Uh, the last point from an economics uh, strategy is that we're taking something that is a, a lower value product and by producing fuels uh, we're able to convert the, the, the bitumen resource into a much higher value product and then sell those products. So again, there's a big economic driver for us uh, and the producers that we're working with to be able to convert uh, bitumen to finished products. So that's some of the the, the setup or the um, uh, issues in that we're dealing with that drive the economics. And I'll come back to that again at the end. But now I'm going to move into a little bit more about the project itself, where we are, and how things are proceeding. This is a schematic of what the facility will look like uh, once it's completed. There's a number of units. Uh, the cost of this project is around six billion or so dollars um, as we look at it today. Uh, again, just starting into the construction phase. Uh, we have, I understand, purchased most of the equipment now. Sometime around Christmas or shortly after, we should have all of the major equipment purchased. It will then move into a module fabrication stage and um, and then into construction, big construction on the site. Um, this is what the gasifier unit uh, with North being at the top. This is the gasifier unit sitting here in the in the plant complex. What we see this is uh, in August of this year. Uh, the site is going through its civil construction phase right now. Uh, it's been completely leveled. Um, it, graveling has gone on in a number of areas. Uh, we're at, the pros at this stage, we we're putting in deep undergrounds, which is a sewer system, fire water systems, uh, surface roads, that type of work. Uh, into September, and lately we have gone through we're into the next stage when we're actually putting building foundations in place, and this is the floor of one of the large buildings that is now actually erected. Um, and we're starting to do test piling, and the piling of all of those sub sub foundations will go on over the next six months. So by midsummer, we should have all of the civil uh, construction work pretty well completed and turned over to the uh, for the construction of all the surface facilities. A little bit about the physics then of uh, of what we're doing and why our process and why it's different than what uh, a number of other uh, refineries have done in the past. Um, bitumen, as it's produced, needs a lot of hydrogen to be able to um, make finished products, or at least the carbon to hydrogen ratio needs to be uh, changed significantly from its uh, again where it's produced. Coking will remove some of the carbon. You still have to put hydrogen into that. Our process, though, is to go straight, uh, taking the bitumen and put as much hydrogen as possible into it. And we can, by doing that, you make a, a higher quality and a higher yield of products. Um, the result of putting a lot of hydrogen into it is we can produce CO2 uh, through process and capture that CO2. So this is a schematic of the actual process, very simple uh, look at it. And I'll just kind of walk through the, the key features of it and how it works. Uh, 
typical to any refinery, we have what's called a crude and vacuum unit that takes in the, the raw production, separates it into a, a light, medium, and heavy component. Uh, the heavy component is coming down to what's called a resid hydrocracker, and this is exactly where a coker would sit in other refineries. But in our case, we take the resid hydrocracker, basically breaks all the molecules apart, saturates it with hydrogen, and makes now a lighter feedstock that will go up for further processing. Uh, not 100% of that is never converted. Um, so most of that is converted, but we still have around 20% that will come out the bottom of the, of the resid hydrocracker and uh, as almost a pure carbon stream. That carbon stream is used as a feedstock into a gasifier. The gasifier uh, combines carbon, um, oxygen, and steam, and then converts that in, in their process into uh, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and hydrogen. The end result of the, this work, though, is we will produce a pure stream of CO2, about 3,600 tons per day, per phase of the project, which is about 1.2 million tons per year. Uh, we'll recover sulfur off the plant and be able to sell sulfur. And then the, hyd the hydrogen that is produced from the gasifier is again turned around and used back in the process. Initial stages of our project, though, we'll be using that for blending back into heavy crudes as a diluent. Uh, later stages, we, we would anticipate having it available to the gasoline market. Um, the primary product, as we discussed before, is ultra-low sulfur diesel. It's around 50% of the output from the plant. And we have a, a gas oil stream, which is a, can be used for further processing refineries. It can be used as a marine fuel. It can also be... Uh, the result of this process, and one of the benefits of it, though, is we end up with a, a yield of about 103% uh, of the output from the plant. Uh, and where this is significant is that, again, adds to the economic value. Uh, as a comparison, a coking process would produce about an 85% yield. So that yield is, one again, one of the big economic drivers for us. So now I'm going to move in what it is we're doing on that part of the project. Uh, of operational reasons, very high reliability. Uh, the gasifier unit is on this side of the of the schematic. The syn gas that then comes out of that, uh, it's very highly integrated. There's a lot of heat recovery going on between all the units. Um, moves over to a shift converter, and you take the CO off of the process. You convert that to CO2, and then it goes into rectosol. Um, rectosol is a key separation process, and I'll talk a little bit about the benefits of that again in a minute. Uh, but that separates out the, all the components, uh, and we end up with a pure, CO, pure stream of CO2 then that goes to compression in the pipeline. Uh, again, we talked about the volume. Uh, the yield is around 97% removal efficiency of the CO2. It's 99.5% pure and dry, and it's fun. As we talked before, we have the, the feedstock coming from the hydroprocessing units into the gasifier, some steam and oxygen, converts that over to CO. The CO is shifted to CO2. Uh, there's a small bit of filter cake which collects the remaining soot and uh, heavy metals that are included in the asphaltine. And then we move over to rectosol. Um, we selected rectosol for a number of, you know, and it converts very high uh, CO2 purity, which makes it ideal for putting into a pipeline and shipping off to for EOR. EOR has a, a quality specification that has to have all the nitrogen and other, other impurities uh, taken out of it. The CO2 then additional dehydration, and that's a big step uh, that we can avoid by selecting this type of a process. Um, so the benefits are off for um, sulfur recovery and sales. Again, the CO2 stream and then the hydrogen stream that goes back in. So what happens with the CO2 then is, again, this is a, just the same type of uh, schematic of the different process steps that we've gone through. But now we really uh, go through it's uh, almost a commoditization of our CO2. Is that once it goes into CO2 compression and enters into the pipeline, it's really a sales point uh, for us. And so we're selling our CO2 now to into the pipeline 
to a company called Enhance Energy, which will take it and they will actually operate and run the EOR reservoir. Their business is, is producing oil. Uh, our business is producing uh, finished products. So we have this transfer point now in which it's actually a sale. So we will get revenue from the CO2 sale. In addition, uh, by, sequester, by sequestering the CO2, we're able to apply the credits back into our facility uh, as offsets and we'll have excess credits in which we'll also sell. Those credits will be able to generate some additional revenue for the operation. Uh, this is again the schematic of the pipeline going down to where the reservoirs are. I wanted to touch a little bit now on, we talked about rivers, um, and when we look at the benefits of what it is we're doing, it's not just one thing, it's many things. And so the economic smoking or gas supply, it has to be looked at in context of the overall uh, benefits. So this is just a little schematic that we'll be able to provide low-cost hydrogen that we're using as opposed to buying hydrogen or manufacturing it. Then we've reduced the use of natural gas uh, for um, quality products with a higher yield by going to the hydrogen addition process. Um, and so that yield certainly increases the overall economics. Um, again, we've commoditized CO2, so we have a high quality CO2 that we're able to sell into an EOR market and we're able to capture benefits from uh, the, the revenues from the CO2 credits. Uh, we make a fuel that will meet our diesel fuel that will meet a low carbon fuel standard. Uh, so we think that is a good um, feature as we look forward into the marketplace and being able to meet these higher um, thresholds of quality and uh, environmental, um, environmental uh, benefits. Last thing is we've avoided a number of disposal costs such as producing coke and trying to dispose of coke. So we've taken what was a, a cost and turned it into a benefit for the project. So our CCS uh, plan summary then is we have taken and integrated the whole uh, CO2 capture with the Alberta carbon trunk line. And one of the very important benefits and features of this and why this all comes together is we've had support from both the Alberta and the federal governments. Uh, both have provided funding. Uh, the Rectosol gasifier part of our project has received funding from, again, both the Alberta and federal governments. But also funding has been provided uh, to enhance energy for the construction of the pipeline and, and the initial start of the EOR reservoir. So uh, this is, has helped considerably in terms of getting over the initial economic uh, threshold of being able to put this critical infrastructure in place. It also allows that infrastructure to be used not just by us but by others in the future. So it will be, allow for the continued growth and development of the um, EOR and the CO2 capture industry within Alberta. Um, we have designed carbon capture in from the onset, which we believe will, uh, if we were to have to go back and retrofit our operation, it would be considerably more uh, technically challenging and expensive. So by incorporating into our design right from the very beginning, we think we have a better overall economic package. Um, and the last point is that we've used uh, gasification and rectosol, which is the chilled methanol process, as our key technology steps. So those are the ones that enable us to both uh, produce and capture that CO2. Now, I, I, this is a chart that I use to try and wrap, you know, show what is the overall benefit of what we've done. So if we were to take SAG-D bitumen, blend it, move it in a pipeline down to a Gulf Coast refinery, and we look at the CO2 that would be um, produced to produce once, or this graph shows one ton of CO2 being uh, produced, how much you could drive a car on. So it's about 3176 uh, um, kilometers. If we look at now the amount of CO2 we've captured and sequestered and the efficiencies of our overall project, we've increased that from 3100 to 4100 uh, kilometers. And then we have a num number of other crude oils that we compare against that are being run in the Gulf Coast refineries today. 
So it just puts it on some sort of a, a relative scale for what we think are the benefits of being able to capture CO2 and the improvements we've made over conventional refining of oil sands bitumen. So a, a couple points then on how we look at it. And going back to the, the chart we had at the beginning with the three circles, we're looking at the, the, the three uh, corner posts for what we're trying to do is uh, we have all this production uh, oil sands coming on. As far as the production curves show, it looks like we'll always be able to fill the pipelines that are being put in place and we'll always be a, a, a law mark in Alberta and be able to take advantage of that. So our project, while not solving all of those, will at least provide additional market for oil sands bitumen and we're going to be able to take advantage of the the, uh, the supply in Alberta to have some of the best pricing for any refinery in North America. The other point I wanted to make here is that we have a very um, uh, limited market in terms of growth in oil sands. So we move the oil sands production into the into conventional markets and where it's going to go. Um, by converting that into fuels, we have now, uh, particularly with diesel fuel, a commodity that uh, industry is used to, understands, and it, it solves a lot of the, the problems of trying to, to diversify markets. Um, it's also, right now, it's being done, it's very social, socially acceptable and acceptance in terms of moving those types of commodities into the marketplace versus all the challenges you have trying to move additional bitumen into the marketplace. So those are kind of the, the, the market access and moving into a whole different commodity area is some of the additional benefits we see from the approach we've taken. Uh, so lastly, going back again to the three, three elements of our uh, business plan is that we've created the market for bitumen, we're managing the CO2 issue within Alberta, and we've also created the economic benefit and the jobs by having uh, the bitumen production uh, process and convert it into finished products within Alberta. Uh, so with that, that really summarizes the, the project and the features of our project and where we are right now with that. And I'll hand this back over to Kevin O'Brien uh, and the further discussion and questions. Well, thank you very much, Terry. Uh, that was a very intriguing, Terry and Kevin, a very intriguing analysis of what could be a very exciting project up there. And it's always striking when you have a project that has so many different revenue streams. It seems like such a critical factor in order to make these things become very successful. Uh, perhaps if I could start with uh, one of the first questions that we had was that uh, does Enhance Energy have rights to the CO2 for any future phases of the refinery? Now, am I online again? Yes, you are. Uh, yeah, they have, um, well, that's getting a little bit into our contract uh, with uh, Enhance, but at this point in time, Enhance has a contract to purchase the CO2 uh, from the first phase of our project. Great. Uh, here's another comment that we had just received. It says, thanks for an excellent presentation. You show that you showed that a projected growth in heavy oil sands processing out to 2030. So they ask, uh, what's the impact of the current shale gas boom in Northern America on the outlook of heavy oil sands? Uh, well, I would say that there are really some different markets. When you're talking about shale gas and, and the use of gas, um, Bitumen blends are typically going into refinery and refined products. Um, I think what the graph shows, though, is that we're all, with the amount of resource we have, we're all, always able to produce up to the limits of our, our market access, our pipeline uh, capabilities, and our takeaway capacities. So, uh, you know, I don't foresee any lack of opportunity to produce more um, uh, bitumen blends, bitumen, uh, in the future. Um, in terms of what the market needs and wants, that's something you know uh, the future will have to to show us what it uh, what it needs. Well, here's another one. Uh, what's the mechanism in GHG protocol for the CO2 credit generation? 
it sounds like your uh, project is receiving income from selling the CO2 as well as credits from avoid, avoiding the emissions. Uh, th that's correct. So we're able to um, gain some revenue from the sale of CO2. We're able to gain some revenue from the sale of excess credits. Um, the mechanism for credits is Alberta has a, a system in place right now where it charges large emitters um, for the amount of CO2 is produced, has a requirement to uh, reduce that amount of CO2 so the credits can be purchased and used for offsets. So if, as a further to this question, if you combine the income and credits, what's the cost per ton of CO2? I can't tell you that right now. We'll wait till our plant is built and we will uh, you know, look at how and, and uh, that evolves. But it really touches on some of the, the commercial uh, valuations. Uh, currently in Alberta right now, the, char the, the cost per ton of CO2 is $15. Um, that sets really the, the, the top end of the value of the credits for the time being. Um, and this, the actual physical sale of CO2 is a, a commercial transaction between two parties. Here's another a comment. Uh, it sounds like one of the key things that you uh, went through is, of course, the ownership structure, or how the project's funded. And there's a question, could you elaborate a little bit uh, further on uh, just how that's broken out, and um, including the provincial uh, uh, bitumen royalty uh, barrel commitment? Uh. The, well, the Alberta government has access through the royalty program to uh, different percentages based on different projects. Um, they will be providing to this project um, approximately, uh, I call 110,000 barrels per day of bitumen blend. Um, first phase will take about half of that and then as we move into our second phase, that the, the remaining volume is available for that second phase. Uh, what Alberta does with additional royalty programs and uh, requirements and producers is really something that they will manage. Uh, this particular arrangement that they're, they've gone through is strictly to supply uh, this facility for both first phasing and growth phases. Great. Well, one of the things that I think anyone who's been involved in large projects like this realizes that uh, there are typically many different environmental related impacts that one has to overcome. And I was wondering if you could make some comments as to perhaps some of the unique environmental impacts that you all had to overcome during the development of this project. Well, you're right, and there's our, there are a number of, uh, we look at the NOx, SOx emission, we look at water handling, we've looked at the proximity to other facilities, and it's not just emissions, you also look at the social economic impacts in the area, the strain on infrastructure, power, water, those types of things. All those were taken into account as we put together our environmental um, uh, plan and submitted that for approval. Um, we have strived, though, to use best available technology uh, in all as aspects of the facilities and have tried to make the right kind of economic decisions around the selection of equipment uh, in order to achieve those objectives. Uh, we think we've done a pretty good job and uh, we think we will have, again, one of the um, best facilities in terms of handling GHG gases and other emissions going forward into the future. Kind of related to that is uh, you, from your previous slide, you showed a great map which showed the location of this project in the area. Uh, you also indicated uh, a lot of support for, from both the provincial as well as federal government. But a question that comes up is uh, you mentioned in that area, for example, a fertilizer plant as well as uh, a lot of additional infrastructure. And I was wondering if you could comment on uh, just how you received or what type of support that you 
received from, I would say, the local shareholders there as well that would help to encourage the project because, again, as many know who are involved in these large-scale projects, it's the local stakeholder support that often uh, is critical for success. Could, could you perhaps comment on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that question up because it, it was uh, one of and is one of the um, primary reasons the plant is located where it is. Um, the first point is um, Alberta has set up this region called the Alberta Industrial Heartland, and in that it set it up for large-scale industrial projects to be developed. And that was sort of long-term uh, planning that was put in place. And so all of the, the local communities and the, the counties in and around the area <coughs> have participated in the development of that large uh, scale industrial plant. So this has been set up now in Alberta for this area to grow and get the synergies from interrelated industries being uh, adjacent to each other. So that's the first aspect. The second aspect is from both local uh, and provincial governments a strong interest in having this type of facility put in place with the features it has. And so we have had tremendous help from all levels of government, uh, participation in the evolution of the project, and a strong interest from local residents in terms of looking for future jobs, um, opportunities uh, during construction, and finally um, the impact it's going to have in their communities. So this is fitting into what I would call a long-term uh, regional plan, and it's ideally purposed for uh, uh, that region. Mm -hmm. Well, very fascinating, because it clearly is a, a major challenge. Just a few more questions uh, in some of these now kind of focusing from, let's say, the large scale down to the plant scale. Uh, one of the questions that came up is, uh, how does, you know, what's the, the, the methodology for the transfer of ownership for the CO2? Many people have talked about, you know, how that will be managed. Could you talk to how you all, uh, who, when does it effectively change ownership? Uh, at the inlet to the pipeline, so really as the CO2 uh, comes off of our process, we have uh, a meter, so we'll actually measure that CO2 and it goes into compression. So as it crosses over that meter and goes into compression is the risk and tidal transfers to Enhance Energy, who is the user of the CO2 at the other end of the pipeline. So then they have to be concerned with um, the CO2 as it moves to the line, maintenance of it, uh, further compression and handling of the CO2 at the other end. Uh, through our commercial arrangements, we deal with the uh, transfer of credits and a number of other um, features around quality uh, delivery and assurances uh, as part of a commercial arrangement. So, so what is the maximum amount of hydrogen sulfide allowable in the, uh, the CO2 as it uh, passes over essentially from your plant into the compression plant? Uh, there's no CO2 or no sort of hydrogen sulfide in that CO2. Uh, Rectosol is a very efficient process. It strips it out, and, uh, and then we recover the sulfur. Um, again, we're sitting immediately beside um, a, a fertilizer plant that, that can use some of that sulfur for conversion into fertilizer. So there's some synergies, again, with local industry in the area. In terms of the CO2, though, it's 99.5% pure CO2, and what's really slipping through is a little bit of hydrogen. Well, well, that's that's great because uh, that's always a concern with many of the uh, processes is residual uh, hydrogen sulfide. So it's it's great that you've been able to knock that out. Uh, another question that's somewhat related to that that came in was the discussion. Uh, you you briefly mentioned you went to, you decided to go with a rectosol type of approach. Uh, why rectosol as compared to uh, let's say a traditional uh, amine like uh, an MEA? Kevin, why don't you handle that question? Um, well, really, uh, I think the, the, as, as was explained uh, in the presentation, um, you know, the rectosol provides a lot of benefits uh, in terms of reliability and the quality of the CO2 and the quality of the hydrogen. So it's very much integrated with the entire refinery. 
and does not require any further dehydration. Yeah. And, and it solves, as Terry said earlier, it, 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 it destroys the, uh, um, the bottoms from the plant, which is, eliminates a whole waste disposal issue. Fantastic. Well, perhaps one, one last question, and then we'll need to wrap up. And that is, um, to kind of finalize and kind of focusing on, in on the capture end of things, what were you saying, what would you say is when you were kind of looking at the overall capture process that you put in place? Because many people, as you know, when you look at large scale projects, you constantly hear that sometimes you will hear a number of uh, up to 80% of the capture costs drive the overall costs of the projects. And you see a, a lot of concern and a lot of emphasis on the, that, that capture angle. It appears that you all really have done an excellent job of um, you know, managing the typical concerns one would have when you're putting in a capture plant. Could you perhaps just make a few comments as to what were some of the key issues that you had to deal with as you were putting in place or designing in place this uh, capture system and uh, uh, how did you overcome them? Well, I think it's a, it's a matter of perspectives. We're not we didn't approach the problem from the perspective of capturing CO2 and the cost of capturing CO2. We came at it from a perspective of having an integrated facility that was dealing with a number of the, the issues as we saw them that had to be handled. So uh, refineries need a lot of hydrogen and we also have what do we do with coke and what do we do with the residual carbon that we need to, to handle. So those two items combined with a knowledge that CO2 capture would be something that's going to be required in the future um, led us to this design. So it wasn't one thing, it wasn't looking at CO2 in isolation. You really had to look at the problem from a different perspective and an integration of these different challenges into your solution. That's great. Sounds like you all have done a, a great job with that. Uh, I think we have time for one more question here. And uh, we've just had one that, that has come in related to uh, uh, clean development mechanisms, CDM compliance. And the question is, is this entire project CDM and, and compliant, especially in, uh, in light of some of the, the latest uh, you know, CDM rulings? Uh, could you, I don't know whether you all have looked into that or uh, could you make a comment in, in regard to that? Uh, I have not, but Kevin. Yeah, the clean clean development mechanism uh, is is uh, really part of the Kyoto uh, uh, process. Um, this plant will be compliant with the Alberta and the Canadian, uh, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse gas regulations. Uh, so that's the regime that we'll be working under. Fantastic. Well, uh, we'd like to, you know, give a, uh, a big hand to both Terry as well as Kevin on a, an excellent presentation about a, a very exciting project that uh, will be moving forward and it's exciting to see the, the progress that's been made, made there. Uh, as kind of a final wrap up, I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all the questions that were out there, and I'm sure more will be coming as other people watch this. And as you can see on the screen, if you do have questions, please feel to submit that along with any feedback to the email address which is listed above. We'll be happy to get back to you and uh, you know, get those questions to you, uh, you know, or answer those questions and get those questions on to both Terry and Kevin. So uh, to wrap things up, I hope that you all found this webinar very valuable. It's always excited to, to see uh, large-scale projects like these moving forward, especially in uh, the province of Alberta, and a great project like this, which uh, really has uh, taken a lot of work and it seems to have done an excellent job. So again, uh, I'd like to personally thank uh, both Kevin and Terry, and I'd like to thank all of our uh, people out there for listening in, and uh, please stay tuned for additional information from uh, Global CCS Institute. Thank you very much. <laughs>